people are most easily conquered when they don't realize they're at war. By way of introduction, I want to tell you a little story. After meeting, uh, after a meeting of teachers about 15 years ago in Chicago, an older leftist, and when I say old, I mean about my age, which is now 79, uh, asked me why no one is making any good protest music anymore. Luckily, Danny Alexander had invited me to be part of an online music chat group, which introduced me to so much that I've been missing in music. I owe a lot to Danny and to his and now my friends, one of whom Charles Hughes is with us today. And I'd like to think of today's conversation as an outgrowth of all that, because what Danny has written about is how music has been sewn into the fabric of our response to the pandemic. The League of Revolutionaries for a New America, which we sometimes call LERNA, is excited to host this event as one of our monthly series of events on the last Saturday of every month. We see these as conversations among revolutionaries, trying to learn from each other and figure the way forward. So thank you all for being here. We're going to follow the format that Adam and Kristen will moderate the program, which will begin with a presentation by Danny. We'll have plenty of time for discussion, and there will be music. If you have any questions that you want to ask, comments you want to make, please place them in the chat. Hesu and Charlie will be monitoring the chat. We plan to finish about 2 p.m., unless, of course, you all make us stay longer. So thanks again for being here. I want to introduce singer-songwriter Adam Gottlieb, the Portage, Michigan stalwart member of our Chicago Digital Media Committee, Kristen Henry. Please take over now. All right, thank you, Lou. Um, uh, thanks everyone for being here, uh, for taking some time on a Saturday. Um, Tristan, uh, do you wanna uh, introduce yourself? Yes, I'm uh, what I would consider a friend of the league and uh, I've enjoyed the company of, of many of these beautiful faces that appear today and uh, happy to meet new faces. Um, once again, I'd like to extend the, the welcome to all those who are who are here with us today. Uh, looks like we have a pretty good program ahead of us and uh, looking forward to engaging and learning um, not just from you guys, but with you as well. So I believe we will, uh, if you have anything further to add, uh, Adam there. Um, sure, I just wanna, before I introduce myself, um, say uh, thank you um Lou for that opening story about Danny and the conversation we're having I find that attitude a lot among leftists particularly of the older generations that um the protest music of today um uh doesn't compare to the protest music of the the 60s and 70s and um I I understand the nostalgia um as I also um, I'm nostalgic about stuff, but uh, I find it to be a pretty inaccurate uh, and uninformed attitude as a young person who became an artist in the Chicago, you know, spoken word and hip hop scenes. Um, my experience has been a, a renaissance of, of music that is continuing to, um, you know, it, enrich social discourse with uh you know new artists coming up all the time like you know um little baby whose uh video we just saw um is such a powerful encapsulation of the energy the revolutionary spirit of 2020 um in the wake of the popular uprisings so um my name is adam gottlieb i'm a singer songwriter uh band leader musician and poet and uh revolutionary member of the league for eight years. Um, I'm super excited and honored to be co-moderating this. Um, and uh, Lou said I could uh, make this announcement twice. So I'm gonna make an announcement real quick uh, up top here and then um, maybe again at the end. Um, I have a, a song dropping on Thursday that I, I would say is um, 
inspired by the the revolutionary spirit of the pandemic it's actually a psalm adaptation of psalm one um uh from the bible combined with a cover of war by bob marley and an adaptation of if i had a hammer by pete seeger and there's a link in the chat where you can um pre-save it on spotify all right um all right thank you all for being here again um let's uh introduce Danny and then let some of our other kind of featured um, participants introduce themselves. We're going to try to make this as uh, dialogical and engaging as possible. Um, but our, our featured speaker is none other than Danny Alexander, who you've already heard um, uh, mentioned. Danny is a professor in the English Department of Kansas City Community College. He's written multiple books on music, including the music of Soul Asylum and more recently of Mary J. Blige. He has been a uh, he has been associate editor of the Rock and Rap Confidential newsletter. You can read his writing on his blog, Take Them As They Come. Please feel free to drop a link to that um, or to anything um, uh, uh, you want to, Danny, in the chat. For that matter, other folks are free to introduce themselves in the chat and drop links as well. Um, Danny is also a founding member of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America and a member of the editorial board of its political paper, Rally Comrades, for which he just recently published an article on the main subject of our conversation today about vision, uh, the pandemic, and music. And I believe that's, uh, you know, what he's basing his presentation off of. Um, so uh, before we turn it over to him, let's see who else we have in the room. We're expecting a few other um, uh, folks who we wanted to shout out. And it looks like um, Charles Hughes um, is here. Um, and we might ask him to, uh, comment as well at some point. But actually, I'll let Danny introduce Charles. Why don't you do that, Danny? And then you can take over from there. <laughs> well, aside from being a Rhodes Scholar, uh, Charles Hughes is an incredible writer, <laughs> incredible writer about music, but a very important uh, music book about uh, uh, just the history of our music and how the racial divisions in many ways were nurtured and developed as marketing tools called country soul about Memphis M Muscle Shoals and, and Nashville. Um, and it's just an incredible book that deals with the, the realities as opposed to the, the appearances that were being marketed to us with this music. Um, and his most recent book, um, which I am still reading because I got sick, but I am very, very much enjoying is uh, Why Bish Bush Bushwick Bill Matters. Bushwick Bill, the great rapper from uh, the Ghetto Boys. Um, and um, so, you know, Charles, your perspective, if there's anything that you can add at any point, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Um, don't mean to put you on the spot. You can also just sit there. <laughs> That's right. Um, <laughs> so thanks. I'm supposed to take it. Take it away, Danny. Yeah, I'm supposed to take it away. All right. Um, you know, the article I wrote, uh, vision and the music of the pandemic. I mean, I drafted it. Um, was, you know, really the result of, uh, you know, just all, all this time, you know, being alone and just pouring through uh, the different kinds of online playlists and things to see what people were doing, what they were making um, in response to First, what was happening, this incredible thing that was happening with COVID-19 and this sort of abandonment of the American people in the midst of that, sort of, like, like nothing I've ever seen before. Um, and then, and then uh, you know, the George Floyd rebellion, I want to call it that, the, you know, the, 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 the police rebellions that, that, that ignited after George Floyd's horrible death um, um, last summer, and there was just so much music uh, to sift through. And uh, you know, at the 
somewhere at the end of about a year of that process, you know, it just became apparent that there were some things, some ways of sort of classifying, putting it together and just talking about, you know, what is happening in our music and are we noticing this um, and what's going on there? And, and I wrote, I, rather than read the article to you, which is at, uh, it's at uh, www.rallycomrades.org or at uh, learner.org, the link in the, in the um, window there, the chat window there. I thought I'd just read this little opening statement about, about writing it you know, and about why I wrote it. And uh, I thought maybe this would be more, you know, pointed to what we're trying to do today. Um, one of the reasons I drafted Vision in the Music of the Pandemic, an article collectivized by the Board of Rally Comrades, uh, and which I'm honored to say is not then simply my own work, is that so much has changed with the way music has been produced and distributed in my lifetime. And that alone vividly illustrates the revolutionary potential of the moment. When I was a kid, we were at the height of the industrial era and perhaps the greatest music ever came out of the same city that produced most of our greatest American automobiles, Motown, Detroit. The incredibly successful black owned music company by that name produced its records using the model of its neighboring car companies and something surprising happened music that edified the class of voices least heard in our society and spoke out against racism, sexism, social injustice, and the war machine. This political dimension has taken slightly different forms, but powerfully affected lives coming out of all of our hubs of our musical culture, from Nashville to Memphis, to Muscle Shoals, to Los Angeles, Minneapolis, I'm in Oki, I need to say Oklahoma City and Tulsa, in Seattle, everywhere. It's also been true on some level in virtually every garage, house, or basement party in America where people gather and dance and talk about the music they love. The recognition of my own voice in music and its connection to so many others turned me into a revolutionary thinker. A dialogue between the music and a music press wherein revolutionary ideas were discussed alongside the music helped these things along. This dialogue helped me understand what no one else was explaining, why my parents and my parents' friends were all losing their jobs, why we were involved in covert wars, why there wasn't more outrage that we were involved in covert wars, why we were supporting apartheid, why we were slashing social service programs, why more and more people were being thrown into prison, why we were re-entering an era of open warfare. I actually remember a little window of time, a 15 year window or so, where we thought maybe Vietnam was the last of them. And why, but the music kept saying, no, <laughs> don't, 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 don't kid yourself and why everything public was being turned into something at least partially privately run. At this point, I've devoted 45 years of my life to music. And I, I wanted to say, and 35 of, of my years of my life to writing about it, but that's not quite true because I, I'm a writer. My response to music immediately was to try to write music um, to write stories about music, to write cartoons about musicians. You know, I, 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 was, I was writing in response. There's a call and there was a response immediately. But 35 years of my life have been spent doing a job writing about music and revolutionary work connected to that dialogue. It's a different world than the one when I started this job and many aspects of the job have changed. In the past, I could never have heard or compared the hundreds of COVID-19 and police rebellion related records I've heard in the past two years. That said, in this new world, it's very hard to gauge how many people hear these records. And in a time of pandemic, it's harder than ever to even picture the size of the audience for the music. 30 years ago, 
a friend of mine said, small is big in this digital world. I didn't quite understand it then, I understand it all too well today. The job of the musician has all but gone underground or to some equivalent in the digital multiverse. The same is true of the job of the writer. This can create the illusion in the mainstream media that very little music is being made about today's politics. Um, or that which we do catch on the radio seems to be about individual freedoms, which are great, but only one piece of the dream of human liberation and a bourgeois one at that. To some extent, with some rare exceptions, and it's funny how um, Lou mentioned earlier the, the pining over there not being great protest music anymore at a time when I actually think it was at a, a certain kind of high. Um, um, but with some rare exceptions, it's almost always been the case that the radio didn't feel like, you know, you didn't, didn't feel like we were hearing the kind of protest that we had once heard in music. Um, in my life, the big exception would probably be the late, late 80s. But as I tried to sum up in my contribution in the rally article, the fundamental job of music is still getting done and the conversations that spring from that still matter. How we approach them must adapt. Toward the end of his life, one of the league's greatest teachers, and as a teacher myself these past 35 years too, I say this because of how well he listened and of how I observed him revise his approach to changing situations, not to mention his effect on others. Nelson Peary wrote, Ideology isn't science, although the left in the United States has attempted to substitute ideology for science. Ideology is a body of ideas that you develop in order to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. Later, he adds, this is in his great book, The Future is Up to Us, ideology must be the truth. My attraction to music is, as I have said, the truths it told that I heard nowhere else. Not that all music is truthful, but we love what we love most because it speaks a truth to us that keeps us going. On some level, every musician who gets heard is a propagandist, a person who spreads ideas, particularly musical ideas, and any that are particularly effective agitate and propagandize. Some say more than others, sure, but they don't necessarily do their most important work with words. Like the great Rolling Stones drummer, Charlie Watts, who died this week, musicians are musicians because of the vision they convey that goes well beyond the words that ride the beats and textures they provide. I'm on day 12 of a breakthrough COVID case. And I've been about as sick as I've been in my life. I have been sicker, but not many times. Flu-like aching and fevers and my childhood asthma reminding me it's still gonna kick it in to clear out these lungs. Listening to a couple of hours of new COVID songs to prep for this talk today, I was reminded of a, of a piece of music's power that I'm afraid I may have neglected in the article. Whatever the brain chemistry is that makes music so profoundly healing. That's some ancient science that has kept our people going for thousands of years. The sound of that music got me to the place where I could write this, just as music has helped me rally so many times before. All arts are the people's tools, and each is equally important in its way. But music brings us together. It wants badly to bring us physically together to dance, to move, to express ourselves in ways we couldn't otherwise. It cries out for a world where we can do those things together and keeps that vision alive even when we can't. And that's what I have to say. I'd like to hear your responses. Thanks. Mm. Beautifully wow. stated. Amen. Thank you, Dan. Thanks. Um, you got some love in the chat uh, there and plenty mm -hmm. of uh, Zoom um, <laughs> uh, love 
in the form of emojis, uh, reactions. Um, I just want to acknowledge that Bill Glan just joined us. Um, welcome, Bill. Uh, he's also one of our uh, participants who we were expecting and looking forward to participating. Uh, Danny just finished his opening remarks, Bill. Um, but uh, for those um, who don't know Bill, he's a record collector and music writer whose writing you can read on his um, blog, Original Live. Um, yeah, my personal connection to him is uh, uh, he, he wrote the most meaningful feedback I've ever gotten about um, the album that I put out with my band during the pandemic. Not, not all, uh, <laughs> um, just uh, praise um, and compliments, but, but very deep and meaningful. Um, all right. So we got <sighs> a handful of participants here. So I think they've been prepared ahead of time to know who they are. So um, I will go ahead and start with our first uh, question. Go for it. And so question one that we have, and uh, once again, this is supposed to be more dynamic um, uh, portion of this for our participants. And we have a part later on where we can have others uh, chime in with uh, thoughts. But to start out with our participants today, um, why and how does music amplify the voice of those hit hardest by the devastation? Uh, it's going to be a two part question. Uh, and follow up is, how is it different from other forms of art in doing so? And I'd be glad to repeat it if you guys need. Um, yes, please. And can we get that in the chat? I'm actually having trouble uh, finding a yeah, version that I can easily copy and paste. Um, we have about a million co-hosts, though. So if someone has a copy and pasteable uh, format in front of them, I think we could. that would be helpful to get that question in the chat. Awesome. Thank you, Hesu. Go for it, Tristan. All right. Actually, I got the question there. Threw it right in the chat because I right. handy like that. Uh, <laughs> I just had right. the question ahead. So why and how does music amplify the voice of those hit hardest by the devastation? And how is it different from other forms of art in doing so? Um, so if Charles or Bill want to uh, start us off on this, feel free. I think we also do have time for others uh to join if if folks are really feeling passionate about any of these questions i would invite that but charles bill or danny if any of you want to uh, get us started and yes thank you yolanda for acknowledging um the great poet who just passed less than a week ago jack hirschman rest in peace rest in power Well, I can start off. Um, Thank you. You know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, um, but unfortunately, um, Rona brain, if anybody's been there, isn't the best. So <laughs> maybe you can fill in the blanks for me and, and, and help me out. Um, we got but, you. You know, I think I, music is inherently Although that we have this sort of classical musical culture that we inherited from Western Europe, um, where music is sort of something that, that um, very, very specialized, gilded, talented people do and other people sit and applaud. <laughs> for, for, there's always been a mass culture around music. And I mean, we, we know going back tens of thousands of years, people have you know, the, these, these, these Caribbean rhythms that we still move to came from, from, from um, cultural gatherings dating way back into prehistory. Um, people like to, people, people like to, to you know, I was just watching this new documentary on Amazon about to count me in about drummers. And, and it, it's just, you know, like people just like, People like to bang on things. And when people bang on things, other people like to bang on things too. And, 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 and we, we, um, we find music as a nonverbal way of, of expressing ourselves. And, 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 it's, and it's the folk musics of the world, which have come together in a particularly sort of fascinating way in America because of some 
for some horrible reasons like chattel slavery um, and, 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 you know, the exploitation of workers. And, but, but this, this music has, has you know, it, it has, has always developed democratically among the people. It's been, it's been a part of people's everyday culture. It's been a part of families' cultures. Um, my old friend Iris DeMint one time said when she was growing up, she was a transplant from uh, the boot heel of Missouri to um, Bakersfield, like so many um, uh, musicians, uh, Oklahoma musicians made that, made that trek, uh, or Okies as we call them, which is just about anybody from this part of the country who's displaced. Um, uh, she said, I didn't know there were people who didn't make music when I was growing up. I thought everybody made music. You know, and she married <laughs> wow. a man who was tone deaf, so it was a shock. <laughs> it, was a, it was a shock that her husband was tone deaf. Um, um, but but that everybody everybody had just always made music, and and I, and I think, you know, it's it's always been um, a way, a something people do when they gather together and they want to express a communal solidarity of one kind or another. And I'm going to talk too long. I think there's much more to say about it than that. But but I think that 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 truth had something to do with why the explosion of popular music in this country um, fairly rapidly overturned a lot of the social divisions. Though, as Charles's book points out, you know, <laughs> industry, um, the nature of capitalism itself worked very hard to reinforce those divisions, you know? Um, but anyway, that's, that's my two cents. Wow, great start. So much to unpack there, thank mm -hmm. you. Looks like we have someone on stack, Ran. Yep. You're muted, Ran. Don't forget to unmute. <laughs> It's your responsibility. Yeah, right. <laughs> My responsibility. Uh, it's not a good thing after you hear what I have to say, but I grew up in a family, and I would just say music is very, very primal, and I firmly believe it came before language and spurred on our language and the need to be a little bit more specific, specific, not specific. <laughs> but um, I come from, from a family of hummers and strummers, pickers and grinners, and when I first started playing music publicly, it was about 15. Uh, and a bunch of kids in a rock and roll band, but we played union halls, union meetings and parties. <laughs> and we did everything from Beer Barrel Polka to Hank Williams and you know, Nancy Klein. But when we played Louie Louie and or others, the dance floors always filled up. And I being a bass player, have found a very responsive that those on the dance floor and those are rocking back in their seats at the tables with a beer in their hand, um, really respond to that primal beat. And those five notes in the pentatonic minor scale, or we might call it the blue scale, um, are present in all forms of music we have throughout the world because of their mathematical relationships of fractions of each other. But nevertheless, um, it's so much more primal. And I would say that try to point out that the words or the lyrics or the poetry that we place before them, uh, get up, stand up, or take this job and shove it. And the list goes on. I only want my job back. You know, I don't want your millions and I don't want your car. I just want my job back. They all express a very great commonality. But behind that is of course the bass player and the drummer and everybody else is adding on the frosting, the melody, and maybe the lyrics. But I can just say from my long-term experiences, there's nothing so rewarding, nothing so transcends, I don't know right the word, where those on the dance floor, the band, the audience are all one mind when you play a tune that they all hook to and that you've got a common theme of a common experience. And particularly here where I live in Hillbilly Heaven, or we pronounce it Hellbelly, the rebellious attitude of take, yeah, I won't use the other words, but 
this is very revolutionary and we can change the world with just a few short notes of five of them different sequences with the use of a various repeats. If I, yeah, I, I, yeah. I would just, uh, oh, I would just okay. add really briefly, I mean, I don't have a lot to add to the, the great things that have already been said, but I think that one thing that I'm hearing here that I, I often think about a lot is that, you know, even in, again, you know, as, as Danny was, was pointing out so generously about my own work, but also about the work of so many people that are on this call, including Danny, um, who was one of my teachers, uh, you know, he always got to shout out the teachers, right? Um, even in times when it's limited in terms of music's ability or because of the way, you know, racial capitalism and racist capitalism and other systemic realities intrude. Um, music, I think, is really powerful in kind of creating those opportunities to remake, remake the world, right? Like, you know, everybody coming out to Louie Louie or someone remixing a psalm and, and, and Bob Marley's war into a new thing. I can't wait to hear this track, you know, or musicians finding new ways to build infrastructure and all of, I mean, you know, there's just so many ways that music, I think, really powerfully, and maybe because of that, you know, call and response that's so direct between musicians and between musicians and audiences, I just think there is, there is, and I've, you know, my whole career has in a sense been kind of trying to, trying to, you know, complicate this idea, but I do think there are, there's like this revolutionary possibility every time music is made simply because it's creating something among a group of people um, and, or among a person and technology, right, or whatever, that, that didn't exist before, <laughs> you know, it's sort of inherently as all art is, and I think there's something really powerful about the way that a community can be formed. And, it, and for those who care about justice, it can be, you know, it can be the embodiment of, of the project. Um, and that's, that's limited, or it can be, and it's, you know, it's too often, I think we assume that just the act of doing it is enough. Whereas I think it, it often is about why we're doing it, what we're doing, who's involved, but at, at, at its core, music does have that transformative community possibility you know, small d democracy and, and democratic life at its, at, its, at its most possible. And so many of the people who I learned from about music, whether they were musicians or people who wrote about music or teachers or whoever, that was the core of the vision, right? So, which is the same thing I learned from labor activists and anti-racist activists and folks who I worked with. So I would just say that, that I think music, as much as it can be, um, you know, as much as music, unfortunately, can end up just reinforcing power structures or whatever, there is this possibility every time music is made of creating a new world or a new a new part of the multiverse or whatever. So I guess I would just add, add to that. And that's in terms of creation and also in how we listen and how we respond back. Mm. Wow. Well said, thank you, Charles. Yeah, I, I, I feel inspired to share just a little bit kind of building on what's been said. We're, 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 we're grasping with words at something so deep and, and really beyond words, right? Which is the power of music itself. And the speakers before, who we, we, everyone who just spoke, we just heard kind of like invoking like the, the really kind of ancient tradition of music that has like continued as a form of survival and resistance through, you know, through modernity and like through capitalism in contradiction with capitalism. Uh, and I, I just want to share briefly, I'll try to be very brief, like, a testimony about um, like why the psalm, uh, it was actually like right before the pandemic hit, I was interested in the psalms because of trying to understand kind of um, like uh, the theology of the Bible in terms of justice and a philosophy of liberation 
rather than you know a philosophy of oppression and colonization and then the pandemic hit and i got so deeply like wrapped up in this project i i ended up adapting dozens of psalms over the course of the year into songs and that made me think a lot about this stuff um you know the a lot of the psalms were written if not in the you know temple period in the babylonian exile period during times of high conflict and uncertainty and even like cataclysmic events um and that's reflected in their deep emotional tone and they were written as poems but as songs meant to be sung and heard aloud by you know many people and um the something about the pandemic just like fit the emotional tone of this project that i had already started and that's what allowed me to go so deeply into it and just to speak to danny's point about the healing power and the survival power of music i mean i really believe at, at a certain point we have to use the word magic to describe what happens when we combine language with music and you know put these vibrations of language that are that is symbolic onto these you know um these frequencies that have mathematical relationships that Rand was talking about, right? Um, so my point is, it's really a, a message of a method of survival, poetry, and music. And Danny's article, for those who have read it or plan to read it, really talks about how that's what American music has actually always been rooted in, in the popular sense. It goes back to the how did the enslaved survive enslavement? Right and um, the use of of rhythm and um, melody and and poetry with a vision, right? Um, and we all inherit that tradition, you know, as Americans, and it, it it inspires us today. That's all. Yes, exactly. Liberation theology in a very real sense. Uh, looks like um, Hesu is on stack. I just want to check in with Tristan if you wanted to add anything at this point. Only thing I would chime in on that is just it just brought to me um, to mind how in Brazil, uh, the slaves down there used um, music to not just make it through um, that enslavement down there, but also empower their um, ability for for fighting tactics. They use music and dance mm. uh, to create um, the art form called capoeira and mm which is now, you know, has been blended now with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, which, you know, in uh, MMA and stuff, but that is just amazing to see how the power of music was used and the slave masters didn't even know. They just saw all oh, these crazy, um, you know, whatever uh, racial epithet or, or, or thing that they had at that point, um, just thought they were just wild and crazy and not realizing that that's what helped them bring about liberation to to free themselves and uh so that that was all that that kind of came to mind i was listening to you um in my mind there so hey sue i will give you the stage thanks Hermano. um i'm just ah, this is listening so many memories and one thing that i just started thinking about as you were talking was that when i was growing up my brother used to play music from latin america from the 70s and the 60s that was really revolutionary and I think that was so key in helping to form my class conscious and that was like a little morita I was like five or six you know but actually there's a question for all of you and Adam I know I've asked you this question before um Adam once said that music and poetry were the highest forms of communication and and that stuck with me and it's not to say that other art doesn't have that same way of um like the same effect, but I was wondering if you could speak to that, um, how you see music as like a higher form of communication that can transform people's ideologies or worldview. Mm. I'd like to just let that question sit in the air a little longer and see if other folks wanna take it up. Yeah, and I don't. I don't want to monopolize that answer either. But I, <laughs> um, because I don't have it. But also, you know, when you're tuning a, a guitar, I have you know, vast musical experience. I can tune a guitar. Um, <laughs> but when you're tuning a guitar, 
you, 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 you find the next string, the note you want, and, and you get it, it resonates with it. It makes it, it it'll, it'll move because you're hitting the right, the right note that makes the next, the next guitar string resonate. Right. And Sympathetic vibration resonance or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and when you make music, it, you're all, there's something resonating through all of you at the same time. And it's may it's it's causing different kinds of reactions in all of you. I I I I don't have you know religion to speak of, but but I have had spiritual experiences because of music, because I have felt that resonating connection to everyone around me that I've never felt anywhere else. And when I talk about the healing power, that's that's a that's a piece of it. Um, um, but I, I, I do think there's something in that just as, you know, and, and, and what Rand said about that, what's so primal is so important. Um, it, you know, we make these sounds to be heard and, and we make these sounds in search of response, you know, and, and, and then when it all gets working together, it's music. <laughs> it's uh, it, when that resonance is taking place. Anyway, that's, Definitely that magical element to it. Let me throw uh, Rand here. I see his hand raised. Take it away, Rand. Yeah, well, we tune guitars on ascending fourths and descending fifths, if you want to get technical. That is the fifth is the, the center tone to the fourth, and that's why the root is down the middle. In other words, they're ratios, actual mathematical relations. I'm double quibbling, dibble here. But I want to draw in mind that we're talking about revolutionary music, but the ability to draw a massive group of people listening to your music in harmony with each other for a common purpose can be demonstrated clearly in the music of Susa, the march. And they played those marches in some form or another before he even wrote them and later into battle. So we have to understand that when we say, uh, stand, get up, stand up, or all the other slogans that might be there, or what is it good for? Um, we have the ability to get people to move together in time, in step, for a common purpose. Amen. True. Point. Let's see Lou on stack. Yeah. Um, what I wanted to say. It's really brief, I think, and that is, um, I think it's a, a mentor of, uh, of Danny's and mine, uh, Dave Marsh, was talking at one point about the anthem of the civil rights movement, um, uh, we shall not be moved. It was not played on the radio. It was, it was not a hit. It was not a charted piece of music but it's something that everybody knew. And when people got together, they sang it and they moved to it and they danced to it and they screamed it. And it was more than healing, but it was part of the movement. And I think the question that Danny raised in terms of the way in which the, uh, the way in which um, music has been a micro has developed into micro factions or something like that um small groups and stuff i don't doubt that at some point i mean the, the music that becomes the anthem of the movement seizes the movement nobody gets up and says i'm going to make an anthem of the movement and declare it such but the movement see the, the the music seizes the movement and becomes part and parcel of the movement. And we'll know it when it happens. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Lou, for sharing that. Um, I fear delving into <laughs> the heavy follow-up questions that we had there as time I see. We're approaching, um, was it 155? Mm -hmm. 
I have the second question queued up in the chat right now. I figured out how to copy and paste it. Um, it is it is dense. Um, do you feel like we're ready for it? Let's go ahead. Since I already asked it, and I have <laughs> no choice now. I'll put it in the chat. Um, can you can you read it for us, Tristan? Uh, sure. The system, no doubt, encourages the ruling class or ruling class messages, but fans tend to love most that music that offers a different kind of vision. If this happens naturally, like the spontaneous movement itself, how can we encourage and build upon the political unity that the fans already love? What is the role of an organization of revolutionaries in terms of nurturing and expanding upon this vision? Whoo. All right. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> um, and we can continue along the lines of the conversations we were just having. Mm -hmm. um, but now now that those questions are are out there and if anyone wants to um, take them up, we can. I, I will say a little thing about this. <laughs> I, I was drawn, I was first drawn to this organization um, it, because um, I, really unlike sort of what I had understood of uh, uh, left movements and so forth, and some of this has to do with the involvement of others, and Dave Marsh was mentioned earlier, and, and, and but um, there was a respect for like, okay, this, this person picked this up and this instrument up and made this loud sound and this loud sound resonated with other people. Um, and there was a respect for what that was um, that, that meant that learning from music was almost like, it was like learning from the conditions themselves. It was part, part of the science of being people who are studying the society we live in and trying to hope to understand how to change it is to, is to listen to that society and to respect that society um, where it is, what, meet it where it is, understand where it is. Um, and so, and so I, I, never, I never felt what I've sometimes, I think, uh, I, I get into this a little bit later when I say something about the league, but I never felt, um, you know, uh, it, 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 a lot of music has been condemned at various times. Some of the most important music has been condemned as being, you know, a bad influence on people for one reason or another. And, and, and it's that very music very often that is, like, that is, that is somebody who gets respect nowhere else and they're getting respect because they're making these sounds, right? And so I think an important part of what we do is we listen, we learn, and we, we, we build upon um, uh, what these voices are saying. You know, um, we're not, uh, I think, I think some, some of the, ideological left of the past, uh, a lot of the doctrinaire left of the past or whatever, felt that art had to be made to a certain set of, uh, uh, you know, um, revolutionary ideologically appropriate and correct um, ideas. But the, the beautiful thing about art is that it comes out of the, the real practical struggle and it doesn't necessarily take forms that we would have ever expected it to take. And, and in so doing, it changes our understanding of, of the reality that we face. So we work with that. Well said. I, I do have some thoughts to share on this, but I wanna ask if anyone who hasn't spoken yet would like to speak first. Um, 
I'm also just going to read the chat a little bit. Hmm. Right. Thank you for that, um, Yolanda, in the chat. Um, that's powerful. Those images from Nelson. I, I'm trying to order my thoughts. Um, one concept I want to like introduce into the conversation that we've been talking about that Danny especially just, I think, talked about, although we haven't explicitly used the term yet, is cultural work. Or if we want to be even more technical and Marxist about it, cultural production. Um, what does that mean? Um, I think, you know, one of the things that changed my life was, was identifying as a cultural worker. But over time, I've started to, you know, come to the conclusion more and more that actually all revolutionaries in times of revolution are called upon to be cultural workers in one form or another, which is a broader, um, you know, category than just artist, right? A cultural worker means you are, you are the workers, we are the workers that are producing culture. Now, what does that mean? It's so abstract and intangible, but actually when you're in a space full of cultural workers, it's very clear and very tangible what that means. It, it, it means the way that we talk to each other, the way that we share space, the kinds of containers that we create, the ways that we can uh, make it so that people can be more fully human and say things that are hard to say and people can hear things that are hard to hear. You know, all of that is culture, you know? And um, so whether we're teachers, writers, educators, or even just, you know, members of our community, who are engaged, you know, we can think of ourselves as cultural workers, but certainly if we're if we're creating art, um, we we are creating culture too. And um, you know, when I think about that, I think about you know the youth spoken word scenes that I grew up in and kind of came of age in, um, and which has a, a big overlap in hip hop and the cultural values of hip hop, which are rooted in you know black arts and and music and forms that came before it um from the us as well as you know reggae from jamaica um you know the the, the ethic was always very clear that as long as you were honest and authentic and knew where you come from and who you are that we are not here to judge based on false categories that have been imposed on us by the oppressors such as race and gender, that we are here to challenge those. And we need to be internally critical of our own communities, um, as well as, you know, united in our kind of countercultural stance. Um, and as a white person, you know, kind of using these uh, forms that are rooted in, in black struggle and oppression, I have to, you know, think about this a lot. And um, I, <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I'm struggling with what I really want to say. But I, I um, ended up, I ended up naming my band One Love, which became like a, a sacred mantra to me that has roots in both hip hop and reggae. Um, and just something I want to say about One Love. And then I'll stop. I'll pass the mic, as it were. Um, is that uh, its its origins are actually from Marcus Garvey, um, one God, one aim, one destiny, and his separatist, pan Africanist vision of returning to Africa, um, which Marley also shared, but also changed and expanded. And Marley, as a person whose father was white. Um, and a colonizer, you know, of the of the privileged class, and whose mother was a poor uh, black Jamaican woman, he really embodied the contradictions um, that that racial capitalism cannot resolve. And when he um, sang "One Love," he really expanded its meaning to be a vision of you know unity across racial categories that that really changed the original meaning of Marcus Garvey's 
uh, message and he's been criticized for that but also it's worth pointing out that that is how we know about the phrase one love is because of marley's music and his his you know revolutionary vision um and so my point is that you know the the music uh of the oppressed becomes something that everyone can actually relate to and 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 enter into um and, and as long as we're humble and honest about who we are and where we come from we can all identify with it and it becomes a deeply revolutionary force that's all thank you wow <laughs> yeah some beautiful present thank you for sharing that um a lot of good history there uh we have lou and I don't know if Lou is going to transition into our next piece uh, following whatever statements you have here. Um, take it a, away, Lou. That's a good cue. I'll be it, happy. It's, yeah. Um, the, the thing I wanted to say was people have referred to Jack Hirschman uh, <clears throat> already. Jack died a week ago. Uh, he was a member of the league founding member of the league and a member of its uh, cultural committee, national cultural committee. And when we would meet, he would say, you know, I don't like to, you know, you know people call me a poet. And of course I write poetry, I'm a poet, but I'm a cultural worker. I think it's important to say worker, pretty much the way Adam was emphasizing. <clears throat> I wanted to say that but I also wanted to say that Jack and uh, Nelson Peary's wife, Su Ying, were mentors of mine. And both of them insisted that everyone is an artist, not just the people who are, um, who make music on records, not just the people who, uh, who sit in the academy and, uh, and publish and, and that sort of thing. Not just that, but everybody is an artist. Everybody is creative. And I have to say that if anybody has of the younger generation has really embodied that spirit for me, it is Adam. Taught me a lot about that in the open mics that, that he has led and welcomed people into to give whatever they could of themselves as creative people. Because uh, if we're talking about how, um, how this, this process nourishes and uh, changes society, it is in the process of meeting together, of exchanging these ideas, whether they're musical, poetic, dance, visual, whatever, and creating a new world. Um, now, that said, it's my task at this point to, to have a, a bit of a musical break. You're going to have a chance to see something of what Adam has produced and it's preceded by another video that Bill Guan, who's unfortunately dropped off of this call, suggested. So the two of them, I think, go very well together and you'll see why, I think, when I share the screen. Yeah, I see what you mean, Lou, that they go together well. And Bill didn't even realize it when he sent it to us. Wow, right. Thanks for being with us, Charles. We appreciate you um, being here, and thanks for adding your voice into the conversation. See, Rand uh, has a hand raised. Sure, go for it, Rand.
yeah, uh, just a little bit of history. It puts the technology in context. Uh, historically, the music and our communication and the audience were all one and the same around the fire, where they're beating the log in our heads against the whatever, or today with a uh, acoustic guitar, or maybe a portable keyboard, and burn some wood or bake, bake logs in the fireplace. It's still based upon the technology. Years passed, the instruments became cheaper and available to the working class. We had the ability to make and use more sophisticated instruments in harmony. And with the event of radio, it became even more popular and widespread. And photographs, which took really nearly 20 years to become popular, it became even more widespread. In the age of radio, we've seen also the ability to form and affect people's minds and their thoughts. The famous fireside chats by Roosevelt and the popular music at that time, many times with black based music and minstrels and everything, reinforced the ideology of the day, you know, and were used to great effect. And then we've seen with popular radio, AM stations abounding that WLS, Chicago radio, I listened to on the shores of Lake Michigan, north of here, much more, um, really formed my understanding and listening to music. In fact, me and my cousins would sit down with our transistor radio and figure out how to play the tunes on our guitar. Well, later, as popular music became cheaper and available, stereos and such became available to the public, it had a greater effect. And we're talking about, quote, counterculture. But the time has passed and moved on. We can remember, and some of us older people can remember, some of you younger people may be remembering MTV. What did they do? They added video to the music. But it took millions of dollars to set up a studio. To make music videos, it took more skill, but it became broader based. Today, we have video available to us on almost all our social media platforms and software that can, you can use, I'm sure Adam has been doing in his studio, to great effect and available to everyone at a much cheaper cost, but you can even spend tens of thousands of dollars there. But now, even now, if you pick up this damn thing, if you know how, you have the means by not only to record, your music, whether it be singularly or placing it on the table in front of you while y'all hum it strum a kick and grin, to create a video, edit it both digitally and audio within your phone and distribute it. Now this has a lot to do with what uh, Lou had mentioned and others, uh, Danny, about the microcosm or the breaking up of the market um, and the lack of ability to control it. Though we can listen to popular music in many cases uh, it exists as bubblegum music back in the 60s and 70s, and today I don't know what you call it. But let's point to the fact that over time, this technology has become cheaper and more available to us for expression, i.e. cultural worker. The success of MTV in the past, or for this matter, the success of TikTok, and I'm always pointing to it, isn't because they're great managers, it's that they have some type of formula and great service, is that video, Today is the medium and everything hooks to it, whether they be your rant on politics or the troubles with your neighbor or with your music, video is the medium today as demonstrated here before us. And it's available to us all. Everybody in this uh, meeting can gain at very few, uh, very few dollars, if any at all, but some time to learn how to push the buttons to do what they did. They, do, they had the vision. But we all can do this now. It's become what, what what's the word? Not popularized, but de, 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 democratically, I don't know what, democratized. I don't know if that's the right word or even a word. But nevertheless, we all can do it. We can be expressing ourselves easily with this technology available for all to see. Thank you, Rand. Thank you, thank you. Um, as the time is flying by, this has been great so far. I think we should delve in the more participatory portion of this um, event here, where we would love to hear from not just Danny, but everyone else who's um, present who don't who doesn't mind, um, you know, asking or speaking. So I will start with a question, effectively, um, that opens it a lot more um, to everyone, which is. 
What have you listened to during the pandemic year that gave you hope or courage? So that is something where I think all of us have something we've been listening to. Um, I guess I can start out as saying that for me, I haven't listened to that much music made during the pandemic that I've been conscious of. Me and Adam, Adam were uh, exchanging some some songs together uh, yesterday when we were conversing, uh, just texting back and forth um, of some that I just I didn't realize were some that I may have heard that I didn't realize were made during the past year and a half. Um, and some, you know, as I was sharing with him yesterday that I've leaned on a lot of older songs uh, during this time of pandemics. I, I'm very heavily R&B hip hop um, leaning as well as uh, ironically enough, as, as Adam was talking about Marcus Garvey and, and um, Bob Marley, my heritage is Jamaican. So that, that was very representative of, of my culture. That is, is very much my culture. And, um, but yeah, so I've leaned on a lot of my own cultural music in that regard, as well as um, just black culture in general, I think has been something that's always been something to lean on and, and be healing. And it seems that a lot of the music from even 90s hip hop is still so relevant. 80s and 90s is just like, we're dealing with the same thing. We just have a much bigger platform um to share and as as i think it was danny who was expressing earlier about how just with with the internet as well as uh rand um the 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 ease of distribution now um of these thoughts you know through spotify apple music um you name whatever the platform youtube um so many more people have access and and i think it was danny who said if, I, if i'm quoting correctly something about uh small is big in the digital multiverse and i'm realizing that small especially when you can reach over 3 billion people, 0.01% of 3 billion is quite a massive amount, probably more than anyone in the 80s or 90s could have distributed to. So I will uh, leave it there. Yeah. So what is the type of music that you guys have been listening to um, that has helped to give you hope or courage uh, through this pandemic uh, period? And I guess we can either stack and chat. I see Jesu raised their hand physically. So we can start. Suck up, but I listen to Adam's music, especially when we need peace, because it really hits you hard. No, it's true. It's like a, I tell you, it's like a prayer, man, in the mornings for me, especially when I'm having a hard time. But his music and poetry, a lot of indies that do covers better than the actual artists. Um, but you know who we were listening to? Because I, I also teach English, and there was one day we were just having a shit day, Rage Against the Machine, and they they know, you know, and and I miss I miss that music. Um, so a lot of that, a lot, a lot of uh, mana, you know, old school Mexican rock that was more political than I think he gets credit for. But uh, yeah, I, I think um, it's a, uh, if you haven't bought Adam's album, for all of you, did I get the title right? I love it, love it. And you get to hear so many, just, just a lot of really great political songs that hit your heart. So for sure. And I just wrote in the chat, which I'll read as well, just um, click the raise hand button under the reaction um, if you would like to chime in or you can type stack in the um, chat for everyone and some moderator should be monitoring so we can get you queued up. So if anyone else would like to share, we got a bunch of names in here uh, that we'd love to hear from. I would love to hear from someone who hasn't spoken yet. This is the teacher. In me. <laughs> Thank you very much also, Hisu, for the kind words. I'll put the link to uh, my band's album in the chat that we released last year. All right, Deborah, wonderful. Go for it. Hi, everyone. Uh, how is my audio? You can hear me OK? It's pretty poor quality but we can understand what you're saying <laughs> okay, you can. let me check my just quickly check my settings because i'm having trouble uh uh let me just raise this okay is that testing sure. a bit improved at all and try lowering maybe try lowering your volume i don't know if you're getting yeah if you can too. lower your input or gain in your audio settings if you're on a computer you should be able to do that if you have another microphone setting you could choose that would be the best or or external headphones or something but we can understand you and yes i think you might have backed up from the mic a little bit and it was a little quieter but a little easier to understand you uh all right testing is this improved no. slightly we'll, we'll roll with it Okay, because uh, I don't have an external mic, 
And I had a Linux operating system. I don't have a game control. Um, I, I have different settings uh, than other operating systems, and I don't have a lot of control. So you're good. Not, don't worry about it. Intelligible. Okay. Or uh, you know, acoustically intelligible. Um, I have derived a lot of uh, comfort during the pandemic, especially in early winter when my anxiety level rose as I faced the, the winter uh, with COVID pre-vaccination time, uh, I really had to set aside time to calm myself. Um, and I found myself returning to quite old music, which is uh, my era of music. And um, I, I, I have to burn some essential oils, light a candle, put on the headphones, and uh, listen to some songs. I am all right. This, here goes Rosie and the Originals, Angel Baby. I find beautiful. Um, the Flamingos, I only have eyes for you. Stunning to me. Um, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer from the beginning. Um, just uh, those three, there, there are many, many others, but for our time here and for the limits of my memory here, um, those, those songs uh, just gave, they, they calmed my nervous system. And, uh, and then if I was feeling a little more energetic, Shorty Long's function at the junction. So uh, there you go. <laughs> what can I say? That's it. Thank you, Deborah. Love it. We got some good answers coming in in the chat too. Uh, Pearl Jam from Eric, um, HER, uh, and the In the Heights soundtrack from Elizabeth. Um, loving this. Um, Uh, feel free to uh, share out loud if anyone else wants to answer this question. And also feel free to take up any of the other questions. We've got a few more questions we can um, throw out there as well. We only have about 10 more minutes for this part of the discussion on our plan. Thanks for that being those. said, people can ask their own questions too. That is true. Go for it, Lou. Well, I think um, before Danny's uh, spot, uh, Spotify playlist came out, which you can all access on uh, Learn a website. Uh, but before his uh, his, Sp his uh, Spotify playlist came out, the thing that really struck me during the pandemic first, and I went back to over and over again, was the Chicks uh, March. Um, I was just floored by that. Hell yeah, with the music video. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's I, I listen to pretty much everything on YouTube because I love to see who's performing. Mm -hmm. And the music video on that was just stunning. And, and uh, I, I, I found that one of the things that it goes along with what Rand was saying, and certainly they have a lot of money to play with, but they did that in a matter of weeks. I mean, you know, that that was produced a, a month, I think it was actually distributed a month after George Floyd was murdered. So it was it was just it, it was a testament to what's possible under the technology that we've got now. And it was rousing. It was just rousing. Um, so I just wanted to say that I wanted to also echo what Charlie said in the chat about Son Monarchas. Uh, I really appreciate their music. Um, and also, I also go back to old stuff over and over again. Um, my tradition 
growing up with classical music. So I didn't really pay much attention to rock and roll until I met people like Danny. So um, I came to this very, very late. But um, times like this in the pandemic, I go back to something like, uh, I mean, I go back to Bach and I go back to uh, the G Brahms German Requiem in particular, which just has always been soothing to me and uplifting and visionary in a, in a kind of a way. So I, I think that these are kinds of things to think about. But I think we all access um, these kind, we all access what is powerful for us individually um, because we all have individual sensibilities. We may all believe and fight for a new world, but we all access it in our own path. And I think that's important to understand too. That's one of the things I think that Sue and Jack taught me years ago is to really respect the work in all forms. So I'm done. Great, thank you, Lou. I love the parallel conversations we have going. We have a very robust sharing um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, session happening in the chat right now. I encourage everyone to share, I mean, to save the chat, which you can do if you're on a computer, um, just by hitting the three little dots next to the uh, chat um, and check out all these great recommendations later. Thanks for that reminder. Um, yeah. Um, I see Ran. Lou, did you want to add more to what you just said? Well, no, just, uh, just that, um, Adam, you put in uh, the thing about the Prince album. I just posted on uh, Facebook in preparation for today something that Danny wrote uh, about Prince earlier this year. So you might want to look back at that. Danny's blog is really a, a tremendous treasury of, of, uh, of writing about music. And he wrote something about Prince, which I found very striking. So just to, that's it. All right, great. Thank you. Go for it, man. Yeah, I just challenge you all to take an old version of music. This land is your land. Yeah, Woody Guthrie. And uh, look to the new version. It's not so new, but a few years ago, six or so. Uh, Sharon Jones. Uh, I forget the rest of the band's name, but she made it work. Uh, this land. Jones. Yeah. And it's R&B. And I have an act that used to play this. We start off with Woody's. And I'd go, mm -hmm. oh, now that was then. This is now. Let's start off with the bass line with this land with Sharon Jones. And it's an R&B version. Listen to it. You'll get your feet a moving. And if we had that available to queue up, I'd love to have you run it. But that's not got the time now. So listen to this mm -hmm. plan by Sharon Jones. She has passed away due to pendiatric cancer just a few years ago. But nevertheless, mm. her energy is still with that song and brought it to pay to the new to a new audience. Absolutely. No, that, that version is incredible. I've actually adapted it um, and used it as a liturgical song, combining it with the Song of the Sea from the Book of Exodus, uh, one of the oldest poems in the Bible um, that's said by uh, millions of Jews every Friday night and Saturday morning as like a liberation song. Um, I, just last night, I shared that with my congregation. Um, to, we, we sing a couple verses of Sharon Jones, This Land, and then um, mash it up with the Hebrew uh, words from the Torah. Um, I wanted to share that with you, uh, uh, Ran, because I think you got me into that version of that, and it's it's been very deep for me. Um, I'm gonna throw out one last question. This might be too big of a question, um, for us to tackle in just the, you know, couple or few minutes that we have uh, left. But this was the last question in kind of our list 
Um, and it, it really stands out to me. With the mainstream of music, a relatively small part of what fans hear today, how do we unite the music communities that exist in thousands of different musical multiverses? This is what's so wonderful about music is that it's got so many, you know, different worlds. Um, but then as revolutionaries trying to unite the revolutionary class, how can we um, be weavers, right? Like, uh, you know, Pete Seeger and the weavers. Um, how, how can we um, contribute toward the one love, right? Like, like the whalers, um, uh, whether we're musicians or not, artists or not, well, we're all creatives, we're all artists in a sense. Um, and, and we're talking about the art of revolution. How, how do we bring these worlds together? Anyone have any thoughts off the top of their head on that? I seem to be able to do top of the head. So I'll, I'll go. Yeah. And I'm right. not good at saying stack or whatever I'm supposed to do, but <laughs> that was good. Jason, Jason, after me. So. Uh, I, I, uh, um, I think, I think, you know, the, the, the ideas, you know, we, there used to, there was this great picture that I think our, our comrade Damon Hartley took that was on the, on the, in the People's Tribune of this, someone holding up all the different issues at a protest and saying, you know, it's all the same it's one issue. It's not, you know, all these issues. It's, it's one issue. I think um, finding, um, finding the, the revolutionary vision that binds these things together can be part of what that fabric is that we weave, you know, these, these, all of this together with. I don't know how we do that. That this question is, it used to it, it used to seem like a simpler question, but that is that it. But in fact, I think I think the democratization of the culture has probably made it one where we really recognize that these new ideas are that can be the glue that binds things together, you know, and we can make these connections between what different people are saying and the sounds that they're making and, and the ways that they're expressing themselves. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you. Well said. It's a hard thing to put words to. Um, hey, hey Sue, you were on stack next. So I'm pretty, uh, what's what I'm looking for? Um, I don't care anymore, dude. We gotta get the ideas out there. And so I have a captive audience with my students. <laughs> and a lot of times um, I'll just play music, revolutionary music for them and invite them to share their own music that they love. And uh, every time I have the opportunity to share music, like I was, I was, it's, we were having a big, I mean, I'm talking like a big union rally and they were like, oh, we need to play a song. Well, guess what? I played one of Adam's song, we need peace. Um, use it in my PowerPoint to educate the faculty just last week. So I think that that's one way where we can at least share the music because a lot a lot of students don't know because they're, they're looking at mainstream, you know? Um, and then just, I share a lot on, on social media when I'm on top of it. I think that's that's one of the best ways because then people can share out and listen to that and you'd be surprised who it hits. Um, I, I would I use whenever I post something that I think oh man it's going to be too radical people really like it because it speaks to them and and the, the experiences they're having so so I think that's it, but I know that a lot of a lot of the youth really want to get together. Um, I, I think that's why you saw so many people going to Lollapalooza in Chicago, even though there's a pandemic going on and so there's that hunger too to just come together. And, 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 you know, experience concerts and whatnot. But yeah, sneak it in there, man, any chance you get. <laughs> Beautiful, thank you. Um, I'm gonna uplift what Elizabeth put in the chat here as well. I really appreciate the practical, you know, things that Hisu just said and following the big ideas that Danny started this off with and Elizabeth, is is also kind of talking about both here by supporting the conditions for artists to work <laughs> housing healthcare access to their proceeds that work generates we are strong like a rope of various fibers absolutely 
artists gotta <laughs> gotta live right amen that's how we can support but the same way we support everyone um okay beautiful well it's 248 maybe um you can call for any last quick comments if people uh want to put them in the chat of course we have time for that if you uh want to make your last comment out loud now's your chance while people are thinking about that i'll share my announcement one last time which is that my psalm one medley drops next thursday there's a link to pre-save it on spotify in the chat and if you're not on spotify um there will be a you know landing page for it just you can follow me on social media for that um same on instagram and facebook at adam gottlieb and one love um and then uh we'll be releasing a full band single later in september um so uh feel free to drop similar announcements in the chat any last comments before we turn it over to danny i believe uh we'll have a a brief um you know word about the league um i don't see any hands up or anyone on on chat tristan do you want to uh offer a closing thought I just like to express that uh, music is. I think I wrote um, a comment uh, slightly earlier. It just it music transcends comprehension. Um, I think when we try to define it or really define how it really affects us, like it, I mean, it, it's it's a tool that it's like a multi tool, like a special magical multi tool that that appeals to each of us in its own unique way. Um, it could be healing. It could be empowering. It could be something that just you know you're pissed off and you really want to get that energy out um it, it it just has so many ways um of expression which i think really speaks to the human experience uh as a whole but also still to some degree it transcends in the sense that i think it connects us in a in such a magical invisible way like it's really not tangible to really explain how but it's it just yeah, harmonies just speak to us. Um, when 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 there's a note that's not resolved, we all feel that tension. And then when it's resolved, we feel that relief. It's just it's something that's unspeakable, but we feel and it transcends language. So I do believe um, whomever mentioned that before, I don't know if it was Lou, Danny, whomever um, had said, I believe that it's it's something that came before language. I think sound and music, um, I, I definitely believe came before because there's people in Japan who are rocking a hip hop you know, doing break dancing, and they don't know a lick of what's being stated. They don't know one word, you know, um, or people in Germany or who, wherever it is in the world, like just seeing how hip hop is influenced, you know, um, in the world and how reggae is influenced in the world and dance hall. And, and, you know, it's just, it's amazing to see that people can bob their head to something that they don't even understand the words to because the music itself, um, be it words or, or the sound. Um, and I think that's the beauty too, that it, it expands it when you have the words. Um, I was hearing a song by a Mexican uh, group, didn't understand any of the words in the song, but it said essentially, like I was just vibing to the energy. And when I, I had the music translated afterwards, they were speaking to the effect that we were the first um, indigenous Americans. We are more American than you Americans. And it was speaking like when I read the lyrics, it just it blew my mind because I was already just, you know, vibing to the music. And I was like, oh, this is really profound. This is some revolutionary stuff right here. Uh, so anywho, that's some of my thoughts. And I, I just love that I was able to be a part of this musical revolutionary experience because I am not classified as an artist, but I am a creative and I do love music um, as a consumer, if nothing more. And the more I learn is the more I love it. And I appreciate all you guys being here. So I will slide it over uh, to get some finishing remarks there. Thank you so much, guys. Amen. Thank you. Yes, everything that he just said. Um, Danny, why don't you uh, give us a, a word about the league as we're wrapping up here? OK, um, you can hear me, right? OK. Um, so I, I, I came to the league a few years before it existed by way of an organization disbanded to make way for it, the Communist Labor Party. Um, as far as I can remember at that time, we had one paper, it was called the People's Tribune. Um, and um, there was no greater distributor of that paper than that cultural worker whose name has come up a few times here today, Jack Hirschman. 
Um, uh, you know, people, we tend to parse these things and I don't know if it's a Western culture thing or what it is. We separate poetry from music or whatever. But if you ever heard Jack read a poem or if you've ever heard any of the great poets here with us, Eric and, and uh, Elizabeth, and if, you, if you've heard these folks read, you're hearing music, the music of words, right? Um, but anyway, Jack would distribute thousands of these papers. And in one of these papers, um, I got some answers I didn't get anywhere else. And it began a journey for me. This group impressed me in ways no other political organization ever had. And that started with the way it respected the perspective I gained from my experience, my music, even my semi-rural upbringing. It showed me the reasons behind the censorship of popular music, which had become a rampant cause for the ruling class at the time I began to write about music. It showed me what the censorship of my, my music had to do with the silencing of the struggles of the growing numbers of homeless fighters being cast out of our society. We formed the League of Revolutionaries for a New America in 1993 because we knew we needed a new form of organization to deal with the revolutionary needs of a rapidly changing world. No political organization in this country seemed to recognize the significance of the digital transformation we had been witnessing change absolutely everything about how things were being made and distributed, how the world worked, and how our politics must work. As early as the 1970s, futurists predicted a utopian society where everyone would one day work from home and sell their skills electronically. But like most utopian ideas, it had no basis in how our economy is actually structured. None of these futurists were grappling with what this meant for the vast majority of people who would become permanently unemployed by this process. Before the invention of the transistor and then the microchip and later organic microchips and nanotechnologies, capitalism was based upon exploitation and competition, but it gave many people hope and some ways to succeed. The moment the digital revolution began to undercut the fundamental need for most human labor, the economy began to contract and that hope that kept people going became increasingly delusional. We formed this organization because we knew we couldn't change America and the world ourselves, but we did know we could help it along by building an organization of people who would work together to understand the true revolutionary potential of the moment and replace these ruling class delusions with real reasons for hope. This organization would have to be outward reaching constantly studying the changing world around us, teaching and learning from others. It would have to be an organization of people who not only propagated a revolutionary vision, but who based that vision on a clear-eyed understanding of what's really going on and what can really be done to affect change at each given stage of revolutionary development. The League of Revolutionaries for a New America is a group of people who share a vision and a methodology and understand its necessity in a rapidly changing world. And when I say methodology, I mean rooted in a science, in an objective agreement about what this world is and how it works. If we do not study, nurture, and help promote a vision of what can be, we should not kid ourselves into believing that those who control the world's wealth will not be studying and developing and promoting ideas that keep us in our increasingly diminished place. That should have been one of the most vivid messages of the pandem pandemic. It's certainly one that comes up time and time again in our music. But big thinking does not get promoted by capital, and we're increasingly encouraged to think smaller and smaller. The League the reason I'm in the league is that it is an organization of people who know that the fate of the world is in our hands. And we know that pers that perspective must be shared by the great majority of the world's people. With science and a vision of what could be objectively right now, we can work together to achieve a world where everyone's needs are met and nurtured, where the environment is protected, where the full flowering potential of humanity is unleashed. 
Artists and musicians are already among our finest visionary propagandists. We are simply trying to bring all of our visionaries together to share a deepened scientific and ideological understanding of the power that already lies in our hands. Sorry, that's a bit long, but I wanted to say all that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So well written, so well said. Thank you so much for that, Danny. Um, I, I feel like we should do a round of applause before our final video here. Feel free to unmute and like give some love for Danny, for everyone, for the organizers. Thank you. Yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Amazing. Um, uh, Lou, do you want to tell us about the next one? And then, uh, hey, Sue, you want to show us this last video? Oh, you're muted, Lou. Damn. Uh, I just dropped in the chat a link to the um, <clears throat> excuse me to the next event that we have scheduled the Chicago Digital Media Group. Uh, we are hosting, Lerna is hosting a celebration of 100,000 poets for, for a change. It's an annual event that goes on throughout the world. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of poetry readings around the world. And we're in Chicago, we're going to be one of the ones in Chicago doing it. We're trying to collaborate with other organizations at the moment and uh, in the memory of and the, in the spirit of Jack Erkman. So that is on the last Saturday of uh, September, September 25th. And like I said, the, the, the event is posted in the chat and there will be an invitation which comes out in, probably in another week or so. So, um, Look, be on the lookout for that. Anybody who is registered for this event will get an invitation, a direct invitation. So thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate you. Uh, oh well, this is uh, this is the this is our exit number. Uh, this is a piece by Janelle Monet called "Turning Tables." It's one of uh, one of the ones on Adam's uh, playlist of the pandemic. People are most easily conquered when they don't realize they're at war.